Yeah, welcome. Fellowship with us and share God's love. Uh, just one announcement, the Act Board meeting was moved to September 29th, so that's coming up. Uh, do you have any other announcements that I'm missing? Bring candy for the Halloween trunk or treat. We'll probably do it out in the uh, parking lot again. Oh, it's beautiful like it was last year. Right? And we want to do that on the 30th, right? Because I was looking yeah, this week, but the 31st is on Sunday. So? Where do you think we are, Ohio? <laughs> no, I don't think we're anybody but Michigan, but I, don't know. <laughs> I was thinking about my schedule, having to work. Like two oh. <laughs> Are, is the community going to do it on the 30th, or are they going to? No gonna... How about we reserve judgment until they say something? Yeah. Okay. Good idea. All right. That way we're in line with when everybody's going to be going. Okay. Because you know they didn't know we were using the park either, so whatever. <laughs> I swear, nobody over there knows anything. They don't care. Well, and I wish to make sure the park was available. Hello. <laughs> All right. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries? That's right. We have several. You got it. You got the money. I got the money. Okay. Go back. Our 32nd anniversary is this week, Thursday. Wow. Congratulations. Congratulations. One under on. Congratulations. That's wonderful. We also we have a lot of celebrations this week. I see Dawn's mom's birthday was yesterday. The 21st is my brother and his wife's anniversary. Ours is the. The 22nd is our, and ours is the 23rd, and the 24th is Dawn's sister and her husband's anniversary. Oh my God. We were first, just so you all know. <laughs> and Becca's birthday is the 21st. So what's Dawn's secret? <laughs> what's that? What's Dawn's secret? <laughs> she stopped listening a long time ago. <laughs> she just shakes her head when I'm talking and walks away. We say what? What did you say? <laughs> 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 All right, let us join together in our opening hymn, number 111, How Can We Name a Love? Yeah. 
Christ alone is love full grown, and love and hope begun. Good choice. I have my moments. <clears throat> we gather to worship God. Who creates us and loves us. Who gifts us with diversity and makes us for community. Who gives Jesus Christ to show us how to live. Who inspires people of all ages. To seek justice and live together in love and equality. Who invites us to join for the struggle for wholeness and well-being for all. And whose presence, grace, and love sustain us in our liberty. We gather to worship God. To God, to God be all glory, honor, and praise. And number 127, guide me, O thou great Jehovah. I think that's right. joys or concerns today. Slow week, huh? Well, I do have something. We thought Peyton had COVID again, mm -hmm. but she tested negative. There's no such thing as once you get it, your immune to it, just so you know. 
Right, it does go away. It's like it's a it's a cold virus. It's just yeah, like it's definitely a virus. We all have it. Now. So. Yes, sir. Okay, let's be in a time of prayer. God of justice, give to world leaders the desire for peace, that the violence and suffering making so many places in our global community, marking so many places in our global community might cease. God of love, hear our prayer. God of wisdom, grant that church leaders would use words and actions that would inspire and challenge all the faithful to be renewed by your word and sacraments so that they may be instruments of grace and ambassadors for Christ. God of love, hear our prayer. God of creation, help us as we use our time, talents, and financial resources to help those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. God of love, hear our prayer. God of service, direct our words and deeds as we follow the cross of Jesus, speaking on behalf of those who have no voice, taking risks as we strive for justice and peace, and bringing hope to all in need. God of love, hear our prayer. God of comfort and care, give strength to those who are hospitalized or sick, that they would know your mercy and experience healing and wholeness. God of love, hear our prayer. God of the ages, Give us hope that our songs will join the voices of all the faithful who have died and are at peace in Christ. Give us strength to carry the cross boldly until that day when we awaken to a never-ending joy of your glorious kingdom. God of love, hear our prayer. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and eternal, hear these petitions of your faithful people as we present them before you. And by your grace, grant us those things you see that we need as we pray the prayer your Son Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Join together in our prayer hymn number 348, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. Soft. 
Scripture reading today comes from God, the Gospel of Matthew. Again, this is chapter 12. We're going to jump to the previous text from last week. These are verses 1 through 8. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples became hungry, hungry and began to pick the heads of grain and eat. But when the Pharisees saw this, they said to him, Look, your disciples do what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he became hungry, he and his companions? How he entered the house of God and they ate the consecrated bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests alone? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests of the temple break the Sabbath and are innocent? But I say to you that something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known that what this means, I desire compassion and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The Word of God for the people of God. 
Will you please join with me in the prayer to the Holy Spirit? Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your consolations. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So, continuing uh, last week with how we can be in better dialogue with the world, uh, non-Christians and other Christians alike, um, this week I would like to talk about um, the first three of what are called, uh, traditionally called, the seven rules of Hillel. Now, for those of you who don't know who Hillel is, uh, he was a uh, Jewish rabbi. Uh, traditionally, he uh, is said to have been born around 110 BC, so uh, the year 110 before Christ, and died around 10 AD. So he is one of only four people, including Moses, uh, that lived to the full 120 years of life. Uh, he was a uh, leader of the Pharisees and of the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin were the courts uh, of the time. Uh, it is attributed to him that he developed uh, to he, he developed the idea of writing down what was called the oral tradition into uh, two different kinds of texts, one called Talmud, which is commentary, and one which is Mishnah, which is uh, basically arguments. <laughs> uh, there is actually very strong evidence that Jesus came from what later became called the school of Hillel. Particularly because Hillel was known at the time for being a particular proponent for arguing the spirit of the law, as opposed to one of his contemporaries, whose name was Shammai, who was uh, strong into arguing for the letter of the law. And it's important to point those out, because you see a lot of this still going on in Jesus with his arguments with the Pharisees. So he wrote down uh, rules that had already existed prior to him. He just was the one to write them down and kind of clarify them. And there are seven of them, and Jesus uses the first three here in this text. So I wanna show you how Jesus uses them and how it can influence our reading of the text and how it can inform our discussion with other people about their own understanding of scripture. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> The base conflict here, right? It's the Sabbath day. Jesus and his disciples are walking through the grain fields. The, the disciples are hungry. They pick grain. Now, reaping on the Sabbath is one of those rules that's, you know, it's against the rule to reap on the Sabbath. Uh, but they're hungry, so they, you know, pick something so they can eat. And the Pharisees then confront Jesus saying, your disciples are breaking the law of the Sabbath. Jesus, on the other hand, disagrees with them. He contends that they are actually guiltless. Now, the tendency throughout the history of discussing this 
text. And you can look in any number of commentaries, because I did. <laughs> is to make this a discussion about Jewish legalism versus Christian freedom from the law. But I don't think that that's fair, considering the fact that it's very obvious that Jesus was a huge proponent of keeping to the tenets of the law, and there are examples of it all over the place. Probably the best example of it is when he heals the nine lepers, and one comes back, and then he says, go to the temple and go through the offering that Moses commanded. So if it's not about uh, legalism versus freedom from the law, then what is it about? So let's use Jesus' technique here to discover that. He has three responses to the Pharisees. The first, he gives the example of David and the priests of Nob. And this comes from Hillel's second rule, which is called argument from analogy. So basically using another example of what is going on and then, say, and then applying it to the current situation. So uh, for those of you who have followed along this last Lent with our, dis our study of 1 Samuel, you, you should be familiar with this story. Uh, David is fleeing from Samuel. Uh, not Samuel, I'm sorry. He is fleeing from Saul. Uh, and he has some companions with him. They run to Nob, N-O-B, which is this town. And there are, he, they go into the temple there. And they ask the priests for food because they're starving. Because they had to leave in a hurry. And the priests give them what's called the show bread, or the bread of consecration. And that's 12 loaves of bread that are set on the altar before God to represent the 12 tribes of Israel being an offering to God. Those are only meant to be eaten the next day by the priests. But because David and his men are hungry, the priests give him that bread. So by analogy, Jesus says we are clearly under the same circumstances. And according to scripture, he says, there are some circumstances like hunger that can excuse a violation of the law. If you remember last week's text when he's when they're trying to trap him into healing on the Sabbath, which is also for, forbidden. He says, which of you, when you have a sheep that falls into a pit, don't you rescue it? That's another argument by analogy. So he says, basically, look, you're, you're, you're making your argument here, but you're forgetting that there are circumstances in which, you know, violation of the law... And in this example, he's using hunger. His disciples are hungry. David and his followers were hungry. And so we can violate the law under those circumstances. But then he goes on. His second example. And that is about the priests in the temple. And that one is, is basically, you know, on every Sabbath... The, temp, uh, the priest of the temple must go in and make certain offerings for the people. Well, you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. But the priests have been commanded to work on the Sabbath. And this comes into uh, Hillel's first rule, which is called Argument That Reasons. That's the title of it. And it basically, it's an argument that goes from a small example and broadens it into a larger thing. So, for example, this is a simple one. A man's wife loves turquoise. A small fact. Therefore, it is probably true that any jewelry 
he bought that had turquoise in it and gave it to his wife that she would love that. Makes sense, right? So that's what's going on here. If it's true in this circumstance, how much more so is it true in this other? And here in this text, Jesus is saying, uh, you know, the priests are innocent. He literally says that. On the Sabbath, the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and they are innocent. So they're innocent because one law, obedience to one law can excuse a violation to another law. If the priest can do it in temple service, how much more so for these disciples who violate the Sabbath for what he goes on to say, for something that is greater than the temple. And that's key. That's, that's a key turning point in this argument. And he drives that point home with his um, third response. And that is quoting scripture. And that's Hillel's third rule, which is called building a family from one passage. And basically it's applying one passage and saying that whatever is stated in that passage creates an overarching rule for all the other passages. And Jesus picks Hosea chapter 6, verse 6. I desire compassion. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now here's something interesting about Matthew. Matthew only uses the word mercy, the Greek word eleos, three times. And every time he uses it, it's when Jesus is arguing with the Pharisees about the meaning of the law. So basically, Jesus is saying, take, this, take this, this word from Hosea. I require mercy, not sacrifice. And understand that mercy and righteousness for Jesus in a lot of texts are pretty much the same thing. If you are merciful, you're righteous. And if you're righteous, you're merciful. And since, Jesus says, mercy and love are commanded in the law, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall leave the edges of your field for the poor. Give to anyone who asks of you. Since mercy and love are commanded in the law, Jesus' argument here is basically that the entire law should be observed through the lens of mercy not sacrifice. So what's the result here? In all three of Jesus' examples, Jesus first appeals to the Pharisees' understanding of Scripture, knowledge of Scripture, and then he questions it. Now, he's not attacking it because he knew that the Pharisees knew Scripture. That is not up for debate. What he seems to be arguing is that, that they, they didn't lack knowledge. They lacked discernment and understanding. If they rightly understood and interpreted David and his friends in Nob, if they rightly understood and interpreted priestly service 
on the day of Sabbath. If they rightly understood the God priorities of Hosea, they would have acted differently. They would have extended mercy to the disciples, not judgment. Now let's, let's be fair. The Pharisees get a bad name. We have, as a church especially, hounded those poor guys for a long, long time. We have to be fair to them because they are, you know, here we are. That we're in Israel and Israel is occupied again by a foreign military. Just like the Babylonian exile. And they're afraid there's going to be another exile because that was Roman policy to conquer a place, take certain numbers of its people, and, and relocate them to other locations. That way they couldn't band together and fight against the empire. And so they're afraid of another exile. And so when you look at the prophets from back during the exile, especially Jeremiah and Isaiah... You, you get the argument that the reason we have been exiled is because we were unfaithful to the law. And so they're trying to figure out what it means to be faithful to the law. And they're getting a little carried away is what they're doing. Jesus mentions this one other time when he's with the Pharisees and he says, you know, the, the Pharisees burden you with rules. Because they're, I think that they are sincerely trying to do the right thing so that they can avoid another exile. But they've gone overboard. And Jesus says, you're so busy interpreting things by the letter of the law that you've forgotten how you're supposed to interpret the letter of the law. And that is with mercy and love. And if you look at the Sabbath, Jesus says, Sabbath itself is a mercy. It's a time to rest. It's a time when everybody, rich, poor, slave, free, man, woman, child, adult, everybody is the same, exactly the same, holds the same status on the Sabbath. For one day a week, everybody is the same. Doesn't matter who you are. Even the stranger in your land keeps the Sabbath, and has equal standing on the Sabbath. So Sabbath itself is a mercy. And then he has the saying, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now we have loaded the phrase Son of Man with a whole lot of theological weight. And I think there's a problem with that because we tend to heap that on Jesus saying that, you know, that means God but it's used all the time in the Old Testament. Uh, Ezekiel is called son of man. It basically is a reference to a human being. Human being, what do you see here if he says in Ezekiel all the time? So he says, for humans are the Lord of the Sabbath, because it wasn't made for God, it was made for humans. So that we'll rest and look at each other a little, a little more equally. Sabbath and its mercy are for human beings. So let mercy lead the law of the Sabbath. And quit judging people who are hungry for eating the only thing available to them on the Sabbath. So it's not about whether the Pharisees and, and then later Christians are uh, supposed to be, you know, maintain the law or have some freedom from the law. And Jesus is arguing how, what lens, by what lens do we interpret the law in every circumstance? And his answer is mercy. Through mercy. So he's questioning basically the, the heart and the intention there. 
we can do the same. Uh, the, the example that pops into my head most readily because of you know its location in text in scripture especially is when we talk about the um, gays and whether or not it's against you know God's law to be gay and we pull out Leviticus and we use one verse from Leviticus to argue it but in that same list of things that are forbidden in that section of Leviticus is not getting tattoos, not sleeping in the same bed with your wife when she's menstruating. How many of us break those laws? How many people have broken those laws? There's a whole list of them. Just go and look at them. Most of those rules don't even apply to us at all anymore so my question would be you have, okay so you've read that scripture have you also read further in that section and why do we allow that action that is forbidden there and not allow in this other one that you've pointed out that's in the same text Don't you know the meaning of I desire mercy and not sacrifice? Or let's go to, to Micah. What does the Lord require you? But to love justice, to do mercy, and to walk humbly with God. Where is your argument based on that? What lens are you using to, to argue God's anti-gay stance when you don't argue these other ones. One of my favorites, by the way, is in the New Testament when it says no bishop shall be the husband of two wives. So that means he can't be divorced and remarried. I'll bet we've got a couple of them. So why, so that this is where you can get to the heart of the question. What lens are you using to interpret this and why? What is your goal? What are you shooting for? And it seems to me they're shooting for the same thing the Pharisees were doing with the same intent. They're trying to do what they understand to be the right thing. They really are trying to do the right thing. But are they more focused on the judgment or are they driven by mercy? Here's the, here's the trick, though. Here's the real problem for a lot of people, I find. How many people knew the story of David and the priests of Nob? You cannot enter into a discussion with somebody if you don't also know the scriptures. It's important because I promise you there are people I promise you I knew them there was a, there was a series of games when I was a kid that friends of mine would engage in and basically it was uh, like a quiz bowl and somebody would read the first two or three words of a verse and whoever could stand up fastest and quote the rest of the verse and give its its citation full citation chapter you know book chapter and verse they get the point for the team. They know, they've memorized the verses. They know the letter of the Bible. <clears throat> but do they know the heart of the Bible? And you cannot address them if you don't know the, the scriptures. You just can't. So in the spirit of this text here that we've used, we've talked about, let's begin using these techniques in a, in a helpful dialogue with one another. 
that in a very Christ-like way urges people to let mercy lead their understanding of Scripture and law. And begin our own path of understanding Scripture better so we can talk to them better. Amen. Let's join in our closing song, number 437, This Is My Song. Jesus Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the power of God the Father. Know your texts, know your heart, and always let mercy lead. Amen. Amen.